Before I'd like to talk about um, Brazil in particular, uh, to, 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 to present uh, some uh, numbers and some uh, how the countries are changing in Latin America. Okay, so the, because you have to, everybody has uh, tend to have a view, a constant over time. Countries do change. So I, I want to present the demographics, the Brazil is doing better in economic terms. And I want to add, uh, it's true that um, um, Cardozo made marvelous contributions during his eight years. Uh, he finished inflation, did some privatization. But also I think it was very remarkable in Brazil that the other candidate was supposed to destroy everything. <laughs> Didn't do so, <laughs> followed pretty much. And they were very lucky for that because it's consistency. So that's uh, the best that can happen to a country, I think, when you have consistent policy uh, makers. And uh, the Lula pretty much follow and make some adaptation, but essentially it was the same type of um, policy. So that uh, make it much more stable. That was very important. Also bring uh, uh, social stability, uh, which through some social program had started with, uh, with uh, Cardozo, and then he continued. So let me uh, present a little bit uh, demographic, education, economic growth. So th let's talk about the demographic. Um, all the countries in the world are following, um, uh, have much uh, smaller rate of population growth. Um, if you look at the fertility rate in Brazil now, it's already below replacement rate. So that's something that I really don't expect from Latin America. I heard it when I, since I came here that Mexico also the same thing. There are not that many Mexicans migrating to the U.S. So I think that's a view that people don't have about Latin America. Is it, uh, countries are, have much lower growth. So I have, uh, India is going, coming down, uh, China, all the fertility rate is dropping, except Russia was so low, this increased a little bit. So that's uh, a first remark that uh, we, um, perhaps that's a very good because now people will be more educated and then I show the graph that that's occurring. Less children and more education. So that has to bring about more stability for the region. Uh, so the fertility rate, um, and that's happening, is coming down, the drop in fertility rate all over the regions in Brazil. In the north, and in the north, there's such a high, was 3.16 in the year 2000, and before it was even seven. Or so. And that had lots of pressure on the forest because a lot of deforestation come from the, uh, from the big, but also from the small um, landowners. Uh, some uh, demographic pressure brought the deforestation. The demographics sharply dropping. Both the fertility rate and both the, the immigration to the region. So that's uh, very good. The Northeast also, there's another source of poverty in Brazil, and the fertility rate now is 2.2, essentially 2. So it's already close, uh, being below the reproducing rate. So there's a drop in the uh, population, even in the Northeast. Nobody would imagine that. So it's a different view that you have. It's much more, bringing much more uh, hope for social stabilization. Um, Another thing that uh, distribution of income, that's a marvelous thing that happened in Brazil. Uh, if you look at the, uh, this size of population, uh, the, the top, um, uh, the, the top 90, uh, uh, the wealthiest people had that 50%, the top 10% had 50% of the wealth in Brazil. The, now they have 44%. So uh, that's a consequence of education, of, um, of, um, uh, of programs and more uh, cash transfer, conditional cash transfer that start with Cardoso and continue with Lula. That uh, peop uh, when a country, because I, th I think that to have democracy in a country is very hard if you have very unequal population, unequal uh, distribution of incomes, so extremely rich and extremely poor. Uh, the poor tend to vote for more distribution, and the rich are not very happy with this. So it uh, creates an enormous tension. Economists have worked on this, have wrote on models. I think Banerjee from MIT, and then his, uh, and I, I think that was happening in Latin America. Now we have less demographic pressure and more income distribution. 
So I think that's, uh, you see from this data. Another, um, uh, uh, the, the, the raising of the middle class. This green, li this green line here is class A, B, and C. C is considered the middle class. So it's now is two thirds of the population. A, B, and the upper middle class on the rich. And if you bring the middle class in, so it gives you already two thirds of the population. So, and then the middle class is consuming a lot. So it's a different view that you have from Latin America. Just a very few rich, and now have a, a middle class can consume durables. They have better lives, they're buying apartments. So that's another thing that brings stability to the region, and I think is very promising what's happening there. Uh, what I'm talking here is more about Brazil, but I think it's most of the thing that, both of these characteristics go f is true for most Latin American countries. Not all of them, perhaps, but uh, to many of them. So this is, uh, so the, the class D and E that they almost didn't consume, and they have um, cash transfer programs, uh, conditional cash transfer. They, the, the mother put the kids in school, they receive some uh, cash transfer from the government. So that's uh, starting Cardoso and then. So the, the social uh, condition is much better. Um, so if you, if you look now the people that attend um, school, uh, how it was in 2000, that was a huge improvement. I didn't have previous year. I'm talking about the census data, most of this, that just come out in Brazil. There is. So that's a, if, you, if you look at the crashes, let's say a pre, a kindergarten and a preschool, come from 31 to 60 percent already, from zero to five, essentially. The fundamental that's from 7 to 14 is coming down, but it's not a, b a bad news because some people are so behind. There are more people than should have given the age. So just uh, there are many people that are still in the, from, um, uh, in the fundamental schooling, let's say, but they should not be there any longer because they just left, uh, they were just behind. So that's a, and the middle, uh, that's high school. High school is going up a lot. So it's, uh, again, it's over 100%, it's about 100% because there are some people that should not be there any longer, should graduate, it's still behind. But uh, it's going up is a good signal. So there's much more education. And, um, and uh, college and university, uh, from 12 to 30%. So it's uh, uh, education, even the higher level, has become more prominent. And that's both from the private universities, and they have very interesting programs where Instead of paying tax at private universities, now they have to put students there. And then it has an actual exam that's very done in a very clear way. So uh, they have access to, um, to higher education in the private school. So it's not only the public school they spend it, because the public school is, is uh, much more expensive. And Brazil had a big problem in the past, because Brazil in the, f the 60, with the military, and they had an idea that create a big Brazil or something like that, high technology, lot of high education. <laughs> Not a lot of it, but some of it at zero, very fundamental education. That's very unrealistic. And now you change it. You have more fundamentals, so you're going now to have a higher education, but not through the public universities that are too expensive, to the private universities. So uh, they are more close to the market, so they know the, what the market needs in terms of training and so forth. So that's a, a positive um, thing that's going on. It's not only Lula, it's Cardozo, and even before. The constitutions were very important in Brazil because the constitution, people vote for better educational policy. That's what's made the difference in Brazil. And I have also many help from a professor here. Uh, Becca has some students that and Heckman goes all the time to Brazil and then teaches us about the importance of preschooling and so forth. So that's very, uh, many ex Chicago PhD play extremely important role in Brazil. Ricardo Paz Barro, that was a Tinker Foundation uh, fellow in the past, and then uh, uh, some others, uh, that uh, Cunha and so forth. So that's uh, very benefiting a lot for the teaching of Chicago. Even some people that before, there's Langone that's in the 70s, had a PhD here and so forth. So that's, we're very grateful for that. 
to convince people that to have a better income equality, to bring a social stability, you need education, and not uh, so much these other populist programs. So to convince a country that's important, I think uh, the politicians play the role, but they have uh, the right intellectual ideas, like Chicago always pushed the idea of human capital, or the Becker, Heckman, uh, is, is so it's very important. So, um, so this, um, another thing that's uh, uh, is occurring in Brazil that's very healthy, I think, is that the formalization of the labor force. We had a very high informal labor force. And then constitution was very bad because we had already too many labor rights code. So uh, once the labor was hired, it could not be fired anymore. So, uh, and that nobody wants to hire them. So it was very, and the constitution made the things even worse. So nobody wants to hire. So the formalization was already low. The formalization means a guy has a, a, an employee has a formal contract with the firm. It was already low, went even lower. But now uh, there are some, um, Again, many economists have played a role in their discussions, and uh, I'm, I'm proud of many ex-students so forth. And, and the laws change, and then the politicians are aware of it, so they diminish the, the cost of formal um, uh, labor. Um, so they, with the formal contract, come from 36 to 44. And as now it's uh, essentially 50 already. If you add that the public employee uh, and uh, military and the uh, public servant, uh, and so it's much better. So it's 60 to 70 percent is already formal, let's say. The informal sector actually is just uh, 20, uh, 18 percent. So, um, then about the Gini coefficient, that's a very nice thing that happened in Brazil because in the 60, it went all the way up. There was a big discussion. The ex student from Chicago said that uh, the Gini coefficient went up because the lack of educated people in the 60s. And some people said, no, it went up, it went up because the military didn't let people do ma uh, work, do lots of strikes, so <laughs> that's an absurd. But then uh, people, eventually people got convinced they needed more education. And then with this cash transfer, Brazil was the worst in the world. At one point, Brazil was the worst among the countries that collect statistics. It was 0.61, something like that. Now it's 0.51, huge drop. It's still going down. So that's what's bringing social stability also. To have democracy and bad Gini coefficient don't mix. I always believed that. <laughs> and now I have a better, so a better respect for democracy. Um, I, I was involved in, um, in the bankruptcy law in Brazil to see how bad things were. The recovery rate doesn't show up here. It's not because I don't have the statistics, because the, the peak cells. I don't <laughs> It's essentially zero, <laughs> and it was worse than every country in Latin America. <laughs> and, uh, and the average length of insolvency, if you compare Brazil to Latin American country, was uh, three and a half years. Brazil was 10 years. So uh, these are doing business, data from the World Bank. And that's what the 2004. And then we work with a group of people that uh, I was very happy because at least I was working very highly mathematical, the four and so forth. That the president of Central Bank, Arminio Frag, my friend and my ex-student Verlang, said, oh, Luis, you don't have anybody else. You have to go <laughs> and do it. So it was a very nice challenge. And then it worked out very well. We had lots of lawyers also, but the economics played a part of it. So I, start, I stopped working just mathematics. <laughs> I was doing this practical thing. And then, um, and there's another have a data here, but the, 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 the credit in terms of GDP went the way up now, much more credit. And some people attribute to that the, the higher growth that you have now. So everything looks very good. But that's what I'm saying that we, we miss many reforms. And I think that we're going to a crisis period. Brazil is growing less now, and many countries are having the problems in the world. And I think uh, I just talked with the journalist uh, two days ago about it, a big interview. And they say, no, you have to put reforms back into place. And we have a labor regulations too strong still. The pension, we, we need um, the pensions too generous. Um, it was an improvement recently for the new employees for the public sector, but it's still main, main, mainly the 
people can retire very early, mainly the woman, and uh, it's too too early. And then also there is a, uh, anybody that gets married, so there is also false marriages. For <laughs> people getting married in the 80s and <laughs> just <laughs> because the person inherited the pension. There, there are lots of distortions. And um, and tax reform, they have a very complex, complicated way of taxing, and then uh, the tax reform. And then Brazil now is paying much. The interest rate dropped dramatically in Brazil. There is a fiscal room there. To instead of paying too much uh, uh, interest, you could uh, diminish the tax. So it's a good time for tax reform. That's what the thing that I was talking about. John. It's a good time for because they are they are diminishing tax in a very disorganized way. So. And pr privatization, they stop, uh, they mainly the concessions. Privatization is not that easy in a government like Lula because, uh, because Cardoso already uh, privatized a lot, and then he is a more complicated issue. But the concession to give roads and airports, Brazil's host, Rio's host in the World Cup, soccer World Cup and the Olympic. Uh, and then, uh, sorry that you beat Chicago, but <laughs> it was not my fault. <laughs> Actually, I think it would be, could be very expensive for the city. But anyhow, so now we need more airports and so forth they do to, to, to put that in the private sector hands. That could be a good uh, occasion. They already put some, uh, not the one in Rio. I care more the one in Rio than Sao Paulo. And then, then this, uh, uh, the concessions could uh, the bring the private sector, bring dynamism, and alleviate the, the pressure on the government so they can lower tax. The tax. Uh, burden in Brazil. Brazil did all this income, cash transfer, the better coefficient, Gini coefficient, and so forth, better education. But that cost. Brazil has among the same level of income. Brazil is one of the highest tax uh, countries. It's taxed as much as some Europeans. And uh, uh, with the equivalent Latin America, they have much lower taxes. So the equation to bring the, the tax burden down. And if you do this concession, don't, the government doesn't have to do this big investment because the big investment always brings some corruption. And there's another big problem in Brazil that stall. They end up not doing it because uh, Brazil has a very uh, strange situation because they're extremely, very sophisticated way of checking corruption. One of the best in the world. The press, the federal police, <laughs> there is the judiciary. <laughs> So many, everybody, so smart people, they did this public employee. One thing that Brazil has is a, to get become a public employee, there's a big competition. So you bring lots of smart people, they check all the, but the politicians still do lots of it. You have to decide it. Either you hide it more, <laughs> and I hope that will not be the case, or then you diminish. But one of the diminishing is privatizing the concession for the airports. For the, so I think that's a uh, time to do it. I think my time is up, so. thought about um, uh, that I wanted to showcase the work of some uh, alumni that are also academics. Uh, being an academic, I mostly, I, I, you know, I keep in touch with the alumni that are also in the academia. The, they were Argentinians, I saw was in charge in the Argentina, and, but uh, they had to have worked recently in, in areas that has to do also with Brazil. So, but the thing is that Argentina uh, managed to do so many things, uh, mostly as, as we were introduced before, you know, uh, say questionable, that, that there is material for that, even in that very narrow definition. So, um, and also I was sort of talked to, sort of talked a little bit about an outlook of Argentina. So I, would, I, I want to say very few things and then link it to the work at least of, um, of two students. Uh, they're both professors now, but a student of mine, so to me they're all, all, they're always a student. And uh, so, so let me talk very briefly about some idea of an outlook. So if you think about a very short, very long run, something like you know, 30, 40 years, the idea of sort of an optimistic outlook is like uh, sort of research in economics tend to find that you know, s being something like you know, having a GDP per capita of the order of 70% of the US is something that happens to countries that manage not to enter into a war, not to enter into a civil war, not to do something completely disastrous. So, like in the very long run, the idea that, you know, sort of you will get to the level of a poor European country, which will be fantastic for Argentina, but, you know, or be back to what we used to be like 100 years, is something sort of to be more or less expected. 
in the sense that it's not out of uh, it's not out of the question and not at all and there's really nothing but just let things go okay so in that sense I mean I think I'm kind of optimistic kind of on the long run I thought so optimistic because it's relatively a good time for south uh, southern corn countries essentially countries that are producing raw materials and that's kind of something that is very much a lot of people talked about the fact that a large part of the world now are entering producing a lot of manufacturing and, and we are producing for them. That's not going to last forever. Uh, you know, sort of China, it just eventually is going to become a middle income country. So you should think about, you know, this research that looked at the rate of convergence, which is an old research that looked at countries in the world, also look at regions within a, a country, like, you know, the south versus the north in the U.S., regions within, you know, Japan, regions within Europe, countries within Europe, all sort of experience like that. They tend to say that you know you will converge at a rate of two percent per year, meaning closing the gap between two countries, two percent of the gap per year, with the gap of the richest countries. So you know it's not that China will be keep you know producing a lot of manufacturing forever. And in fact, a lot of people think that they already see something like that. But that will take a while. So you know this is a good time to be producing soybean for Argentina and also for from Brazil. Um, Kind of in the short run, or what we economists call business cycle frequencies, I think it's most people are very pessimistic about Argentina for different reasons. I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, and these are probably self-inflicted because, you know, they're not pessimistic in Chile, they're not pessimistic in Mexico, they're not pessimistic in, in Brazil, they're not pessimistic in Europe. Well, I'll talk a little bit more about that. I guess there is a sense of uh, good news that in the very short run, apparently there will be no crisis in Argentina, which is uh, like a unique event. I'm so much used to, but you know, even say that there will be uh, an exit from Euro, uh, you know, a breakup of Euro, uh, of the Euro, maybe nothing really tremendous will happen in Argentina. It's not out of the question. If, for those of you who remember like 98 or 94, there were sort of big financial crises that had nothing really to do with Argentina. Like, you know, a crisis in Mexico that they couldn't roll over the debt in 94, we really don't trade with Mexico. We have no connection with Mexico. That was a big recession in Argentina. Same in 98 when there was a crisis essentially in Russia. So this financial crisis is sort of hard to think about what the effects will have, but um, the consequence of the default that Argentina uh, had in the past is that now we cannot borrow, so we really are a bit cut off of the world. Uh, for good, I guess it's not that good, but it will have the advantage probably that will not be that severe, the repercussion of, you know, if there's a breakup of the Euro. Uh, so, you know, in the very short run, it's probably okay. Uh, but let me talk more about the kind of short run. Now, so the idea was sort of like uh, to talk about, you know, the, the effect of Brazil. So, one thing that a lot of people talked about and is, is sort of very natural is the fact that we trade a lot with Brazil because Brazil is, you know, among, you know, some, one of the, our main trading partners, there is a lot of migration, very little, but a little bit of migration. Uh, there is a lot of foreign direct investment. Uh, but there is another link that I'd like to talk about. There is a link to uh, really learning and experimentation in the realm of ideas, mostly on policies. So I want to talk about that because it's a bit less conventional, and I think it's interesting, and actually because of my narrow definition, I want to showcase work from alumni that has to do with this topic. So I want to talk about the, the work from Francisco Huera. This is published in essentially the best journal in, in the profession, and it's really a, a really pathbreaking work. So what is his work about? So looking at, uh, you know, what determines uh, sort of the economic, uh, the orientation in terms of economic policy across time and space. How is that countries change what they do, the type of policies? And how is that this, you know, differ from countries, you know, one country versus the other one? So it's a very ambitious project. So the idea is to think about all the countries in the world from as long as we have kind of reasonable data. This is after 1950s. And uh, so obviously you had to be, you had to simplify it and to use, to use relatively coarse definitions of everything. But the idea was to sort of uh, use the uh, classifying countries that some other people have done as relatively close and relatively open. Let me give you an idea. China in 1950, you know, close. You know, the US was kind of open. And the idea is that there's uh, several indicators that try to give you that. 
Like, you know, if your economy was communist, you were classified as a close. That's an extreme case. But, you know, the, the idea was to use a variety of indicators, then to statistically try to bring it into two numbers, close and open. This is actually not something that these guys have developed, but some other prior research. Okay, fine. The point is that we see a lot of waves, and that was actually talked about uh, an introduction today about the waves of privatizations and nationalizations, and I want to rec uh, return to that. But we see a lot of waves in policies. And we also see a lot of waves that are geographically oriented. Like, you know, countries in South America doing something similar. So, and the, the idea of this study is to try to understand that. And the point of view from this study is that you looked around at what happened in the past, what type of policies have you done? Have you been close or open? Or kind of market oriented would have been a better name. And how well you did. You did. And you also you look at your neighbors. Now, the, the, their work is very sophisticated because imagine you have like, you know, the experience of 50 countries. It changes your orientation kind of year to year. You're looking at all these uh, neighbors. So it's kind of very technical in nature. But what is that they learn from this? What is interesting is that they learn is that you kind of looked on the past when things were good and if you're doing something, you keep doing it. That's kind of the idea. But you also look at your neighbors. And they statistically also uh, are able to estimate sort of how much you look at your neighbors and how much you look at yourself by, the, by seeing how often you change your policies relatively, relative to how your neighbors were doing when they changed their policies. So um, it's kind of very interesting that there is a lot of uh, clustering in space, meaning that you looked a lot at the countries that are nearby to you, but you don't look so much for experience that are very far away. And you see that in very, any casual reading of the newspapers. I mean, like Latin American countries tend to do very, something very similar. You know, South Asian countries do something. There's also waves across the whole world. OK, so I want to come back to this. And also, there is a, the very interesting topics of the false negatives. Notice that something I didn't mention, nor the, it's not the center of the paper, which is not so much to think about, is it good to be open or close, which, which is a very interesting question. The question is, how is that economic, can, how can we think about what determines the economic policies of different countries and how much you look at your neighbors? Okay. I'm not saying that the other question is not interesting, but that's the question from this, from this essay. Okay, so I'll come back to this. But first I want to talk about some substantive issues so I could think about these ideas on, on the context of that substantive issue. And it will be, although there were no coordination, I'll come back to the introduction that were made today. Other thing that I couldn't resist is that if you looked in the brochure in the introduction from today, there was this idea that after long years of high inflation, now Brazil, blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, actually inflation rate in Argentina is no longer 5,000 per year, which it used to be, but it's still not that low. It, inflation rates were between 25 and 30 percent in the last four years, and this year is like between 30 and 40 percent. So. It's not that, it's, you know, it's, it's obviously from Latin American, well, even for, even for Latin American standards, it's very high. Uh, it's not high from standards of the, yeah. Than what the government These are not the government numbers. Okay. Uh, the government numbers, you have to divide it by two. Okay. So <laughs> these are, as I said there, these are the official statistics, I just put it not reliable to put it in one way. So what do you, what do you have um, alternatives is you could use a statistic from the provinces that are not controlled by the federal government and they have a statistical agency. You could also use private sector estimates. Uh, firms that are, some firms, like if you have a contract with this amount of inflation, you want to index your contract. So there is a market for private firms to produce statistics given that the government statistics uh, you know that are made up. Uh, there is also, um, um, have time, I could talk about uh, something called the Billions Price Project Estimate, which is uh, scrapping data from the internet. So you go to uh, uh, all the vendors that publish data in the internet uh, through a computer program, you get the data, and you get like a daily estimates of inflation. It's called the Billion Price Project because they have a lot of prices there. And it's it was not the point from this, but given your, your question, if you look at that for, this is done for many, many countries. And if you looked at that, they give you very accurate estimates of what the 
statistical agencies estimate as inflation for all the countries but one. You could try, to, try to guess. <laughs> so anyway, so, so these, are, these numbers are the ones from the, uh, from, it's an average between the uh, province uh, statistical agencies. Uh, some of the private sector estimates, some you had to pay a lot, so I didn't, <laughs> and uh, the billion spray project. So it's kind of high inflation. And the prospect is for more. Um, so if you looked at the, what the, and this is sort of interesting also coll collaterally because it, there's a lot of discussion on now what's happening in Europe and looking at the Argentinian experience. So this is also, I think, interesting in, in some other respect. Um, but anyway, if you look at the nominal exchange rate, I mean, the, how many pesos you need to buy a dollar, it has been more or less steady in the last five years, while the inflation rate has been 25% or so. If you look at now, there are a lot of controls on imports. So if you want to import something, you need to get a license. So it's really, uh, you know, it, it's very cumbersome, and, and every single import has to be approved, essentially. There are price controls. There are controls to buy and sell currency. Uh, this is relatively recent for the last month. There are controls in repatriations of dividends. So these are all the signals of what happens uh, before you have to this is not the very first time that this has happened in Argentina or in any country like this. Okay, so, so the idea is that most likely what will happen is that uh, you know, the, the central bank is also financing the treasury now. So most likely what will happen is that there will be like a large evaluation as it happened in the past and a stabilization plan sometime in the future. Think about the evaluation of the order of 50% or so. Relatively small for for Argentinian standards, but you know, it's not a, you know, some between now and three years is not completely out of the question. It's actually the norm of what happened in the last 30 years or so. So it's not, a, it's not that I'm making any, you know, really, I'm not discovering anything very new, but I thought about sort of pointing this out. Now I'm kind of running out of time, but it's sort of very interesting given the, the introduction and also what uh, Aloysio was saying is, to talk about another work from Evia, uh, Constantino Evia, another st student and a professor, of uh, the cycles from privatization and nationalization. Why it's also particularly interesting is because the oil company uh, that it was privatized from Argentina and also partly with capital from, um, from Spain has been nationalized in the last months. Now, this is, uh, what is interesting to notice is that this cycle of privatization and nationalization is something that happened in the last 100 years through time and through space. Uh, similar nationalizations have happened uh, recently in Venezuela and in Bolivia. And if you look at it, let me just mention five facts. So the stuff that is in, uh, in, so don't pay attention to the small letter or relatively smaller letter, just pay attention to the title. So there are five facts that are kind of interesting about this cycle of nationalization and privatization. This says they're coming waves. So now we are coming back to a nationalization wave. Um, and this actually happened in many countries. So the references are there. I mean, there's a large in literature uh, uh, looking at this uh, type of information. Uh, they also mostly occur on, the, um, on industries that are using natural resources, like oil. So, and it's interesting, this paper was written way before this, uh, the last wave. So it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, the progress, you know, the, predictive power of this type of scientific endeavor. Um, the nationalization tends to happen when the prices of natural resources is high. Like right now, oil is at very high prices. And uh, they tend to, um, the contracts that are used when you, when you privatize, they tend to be highly incomplete. That's a way that we refer to that in economics. But the idea being is that you know, when prices are, are high, most of the gains go to the companies. When prices are, uh, so the, it's hard to basically kind of share that with the, with the fiscal authority. So it, it, what it tends to happen is that then you sell it at a price, and then when the prices are, what? This is a fact. Now, what would tend to happen, let's just talk a little bit more. And also, nationalizations tend to happen, especially when inequality worsens. So. Um, Finally, uh, the studies that look at productivity, they find uh, that uh, this is not going to be totally shocking, but that the productivity increases after privatization. If you look at uh, YPF, um, YPF 
uh, when it was privatized, uh, it decreased the number of employees by, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but essentially by, it ended up having 10% of the number of employees I had before, and output almost doubled in a year. Now, it's, it's a bit of an exaggeration because they outsourced a lot when they did that. So probably like a better estimate is not that one that is a typical estimate that people use, but it's not, you know, it didn't decrease to 10%, it decreased to 30%. I mean, the gains on productivity was like phenomenal. Okay, so, and this is it's a bit of an extreme outlier, the case, but it's the idea of all these papers is that that's what you find typically. So what is the rationalization of this? And that's the work of Constantino and co-authors is the idea is that what you see here, and it's not just, what you see here is somehow it looks like there is a conflict between efficiency and equity. And then when prices are high, they, they find that it was hard to design good contracts ex ante to get part of this to the rest of the society, and when this inequality is high. And this is a time where sort of societies make this choice and then they, they nationalize it back. Even taking into account, I think the idea is that everybody understands that they're not gonna work that well, but you know the the cost and benefits sort of work that way. Now it's particularly interesting, I think, when you think of this on the context of this learning from policies from your neighbors. So look at this wave; it's sort of going through Latin America, but there may be some hope. And the hope is, if you look at policies that are relatively new in some other parts of the of the world, and Chile now is no longer in Latin America, but you know the other parts of the world will be like even Russia which has, like, in terms of institutions, is pretty bad. I mean, it looks like Latin America type of institutions. It's not like, you know, we're not talking about, you know, 200 old democracy. Well, these countries have managed to have a much more sensible way to do it. So they have these sovereign debt funds or stabilization funds in which they actually invest, even if they have this company, they, they invest these resources and they use it in anti-cyclical policy as opposed to go back and forth between private and, uh, and, and national. So the idea is that sort of this type of policy probably will, be, will catch on even in, in countries from the southern corner. And they're certainly in Chile. Chile has done this with copper. Mexico is starting to do that. So that's kind of the hope. Um, fine, okay, so I'm actually running out of time. So let me just say then, three, just to summarize it. So I think it's kind of interesting to think about in the, you know, Argentina is sort of a case in which you have these policies that have been particularly bad. But in terms of patterns, it's not that different from the rest of the world. This, you know, this, uh, you know, what happened in Argentina, this nationalization and privatization is similar. It's probably a bit more extreme. I think there is hope in the sense that, you know, as you prove, try more and more, when you look at 100 years of data now, it seems to be that countries converge more to the type of policies. If you look at what it used to be like 100 years ago and right now, policies are much more similar across countries. So this is kind of a little bit of glimmer of hope. The other glimmer of hope is sort of the experience of Chile. So I'm thinking about mostly, you know, so think about going back to the word that I quoted before. Just statistically, it looks like if your neighbors are doing well when they do something, people copy it. It seems to be like a very simple idea, but it's something that actually you do see in the data. So I was saying that one of the nice things of, um of speaking about Chile is that um, whenever um, comparisons are made, Chile turns out to come out on top. Um, but my, the, the, the gist of my talk today is that, um, you know, Chile is no longer in Latin America, but missing it. And we want to come back. And we hope they'll take us back. Um, so it's kind of a cautionary tale. Um, so this also draws on, uh, on work by two alums. Jaime Bedolio was a student and Claudio Sapelli was a professor of mine. Um, so, uh, Aloisio pointed out that um, one of the great things that happened in Brazil uh, was that uh, Cardoso's policies were not undone by the following government, right? So Chile has come to the to crossroads in its recent history over the past, say, 50 years, I would say four times. 1970, we had a Soviet collectivization Marxist-style government that um, nationalized industry, um, basically shut the economy and shut the economy down. You, you know, you see in the macro numbers uh, a, a large decline. In 1973, we had the Pinochet coup. So, you know, we tossed the Soviet collectivization model out the window, and we brought in the Chicago Boys, right? So, uh, so we're the we're the good son 
of the of the department, right? We're the lab where where everything where everything took place. Um, and the reforms that were that were implemented read like a microeconomics textbook. You know, start page one, work yourself all the way through to the end, and that's exactly what we did. Um, so we 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 focus on privatization of firms and activities wherever the private sector can have a role. We assign it to it. We 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 allow it to to take it on. Uh, we like incentives in the private sector and the public sector as well. Um, we have an environment that encourages participation and investment in all relative in all relevant services, open markets, both abroad and within the country, um, and. Um, we we pursue competition and decentralization, although there are a lot of uh, improvements that can be done on, in in that regard. Okay, so then 1988. Oh, sorry. And so the, the the major the major reforms that were put in by the Pinochet government were the introduction of a private pension system, which has worked very nicely. The riskier funds have had a nine percent. Uh, return per annum since about 1980 when it was implemented. Health is a mixed system in which there's a lot of private, um, th th there's, a, there's a private insurance system al alongside the, the government run uh, AUGE plan, which we'll come back to in a little while. We have a voucher system in education. We have had uh, labor laws with a variety of, of different levels of flexibility over time, and that's one of the cautions. We started out really flexible, and over time we make them a lot more rigid, okay? And uh, this results in lots of uh, very high unemployment rates, especially um, for the young and disadvantaged, okay? And then the capital markets are open and deep in, to a, a great extent because initially the uh, pension funds could only invest in Chilean equity. So a lot of the money went to, from uh, away from consumption to savings into the capital stock, okay? So, so let's set the stage for the current uh, state of the uh, Chilean political economy. I think this graph here represents uh, the best and the worst of, of Chile. Um, so if you look at the, focus on the Gini coefficient um, line. Um, this is taken every two years since 1990. In 1988, the government, which was one of the crossroads that we faced, was when Pinochet left power, the government had the opportunity to basically take all of the um, reforms that the that the military government had put in, the ones we just saw, toss them out the window and start anew, including a new constitution. There was a, a very extreme group that wanted um, this to happen. Uh, but they didn't. They chose to work from within the model, and I think that that decision turned out to be um, a good one, and I think the numbers pretty much support that. So if you look at 1990, uh, Chilean per capita GDP was 4000 about $4,800, and uh, 20 years later, it's about 14000 Okay, So the growth rates are there um, at the bottom for you to see. So there, it's, it's a very, very strong growth spurt that actually started in 1985. Okay, But look at the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient doesn't move. It's 0.57, and it's pretty much the same regardless of what policies the government pursues. Many times the government has explicitly slowed down growth to redistribute better, and that has not had had an effect here. So, you know, the in the news, so 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 coming a little bit more more closely the, the, the to, to today, the, the big issue in the news in Chile has been the the uh, protest for uh, high quality and free education. Right? Now um, at Chicago nothing's free, right? So all we have to wonder about is who pays. Right, and this has brought about also a, uh, they've put tax reform on the table. Now, of course, tax reform not to cut taxes and spur growth, tax reform to slow down growth and spend more on on education. Okay, um, so if you look at ooh, that's a bad graph. Well, don't worry about the the numbers. Um, look at the look at the shape. Look at the shape of the graph. The graph is very similar to the distribution of of income that Aloisio put up, right? So here you have the top 10% on the right um, having a substantial uh, um, per capita income. It's about $7,000. The numbers unfortunately got botched in the in the transfer, but that's about $7,000, okay? And then it, it's proportional, so it cuts to about 2,500 and then keeps going down, okay? So if you look at the Gini coefficient over time, this is another sort of um, example of, of stability and distribution. Okay, and this puts it in context to where where Chile tends to be. So we're there. We are with our friends Brazil, right? A little bit worse off than Argentina, uh, but very far away from um, Canada and Spain and some of the Western European nations. Okay, now uh, let me 
mention briefly um, the, it, let me so 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 I made this presentation available and I have the stuff on pensions and, and and health and whatnot available if you want to take a copy I'm going to talk about education because it's the one that's been in the news okay so in 1981 we put in the, the new um, education reform and what this did is it opened up the education sector to private capital both at the high school and elementary school level as well as in universities Okay? And the objective was to increase enrollment rates, okay? to allow schools to compete in terms of the curriculum they offer their students, okay? and to establish better opportunities for all children, regardless of wealth. This was actually put in the law. Okay? So we created the voucher system much in the way that Milton Friedman um, recommended. Okay? So the first effect that we see from 1981 to 2010 is this big switch from the public schooling to private subsidized schools, the voucher schools, okay? With about the same proportion of the population participating in, um, in private high schools, okay? So, so coverage is actually um, pretty good. Okay, let me, there's another beautiful graph here. These are not so much fun. So school attendance, for example. Um, if you compare it to 1970, this is the uh, time when uh, Allende came in. Um, but basically, everybody's wrapping up high school, right? There's a, there's there's some dropouts, okay? Um, the twentieth percent lowest income in the population um, is completing about uh, up through through junior year in high school, okay? Um, so so coverage is is not a problem. Oh, I'm sorry. The first one is 1970. The second column is 1990. Uh, and then the last column is 2008 with a smattering of readers in between. Okay? The real problem here is, uh, is quality and expenses, right? So if you take a look at, the, um, at this graph, which puts uh, the OECD countries, um, and it puts the test score on the vertical axis and expenditures uh, by student, right? So we're spending substantial amounts of money and we fall below the standard, right? So this is the this is a quality complaint that the that the student movement has had over the past maybe year year and a half. Okay, so here's another example of how we fall um, short um, to the OECD countries in reading. So if you look at the government statistics, everybody's literate, but reading comprehension levels are very low. So people can read, but they don't understand what they're reading, right? So, so this is this is sort of the 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 challenge for us, right? Is to to continue to improve this. So we've improved over ten years, forty points, but we still fall about a fifty points short of of the OECD countries. Now we understand that the OECD countries are countries that have been on this growth track for a lot longer than we have. So, you know. Um, we like to look up and, and, and compare ourselves to the big boys, and, and, and we fall short, unfortunately. Okay, um, So there's a little bit more about that. Now, the, the system itself still has some rigidities, right? So in 1993, this is, again, um, post-Pinochet era. This is the second government of the center-left coalition that took, that took uh, power, um, created this, this thing called the teacher statute. Okay? So basically, it, it gives tenure to high school teachers and elementary school teachers. So you can't remove um, teachers for, for uh, bad performance. Okay? Um, and it, it, it gives a lot of power to the teachers union because they negotiate directly with the government for wages. Okay? So it effectively sets a minimum wage also for the, um, for the, for the teachers who are in the, in the, um, who teach in the private schools. Okay? So part of the, uh, Part of the reason the, the quality is low, some people argue, is precisely that the teachers don't invest in their own human capital. So, you know, they sit in classrooms with kids that are with the internet now a lot brighter and more informed than they are. And that, that doesn't help, right? The second uh, part of the reform that was important was in higher education. So Chile now has um, the standard, you know, what we co would consider here a state university that receives, uh, uh, which are uh, pretty much funded by the Chilean government and some large private universities that receive large subsidies like Catholic University, which incidentally is the school that has sent historically, uh, it's a Chicago boy factory in Chile, right? They study, study there, they come here and then they go back. So 
if you notice the 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 red line is uh, enrollments in uh, in the in the traditional universities. There are about um, about a million students, um, and then the blue line, the light blue line that comes in second, are the for-profit universities that were founded as a result of this uh, law in 1983. Now, the law in 1983 did not provide specifically the possibility of having for-profit universities, but they found loopholes to actually take the money out. And this brings us to the second problem that students um, uh, complain about, which is that um, schools should not be for profit, money should be reinvested, and they, they talk about usury, right? That, that, that they're having to spend a lot of, a lot of money on, on their training. Um, now, if you get rid of these universities as the students um, pretend, then we will lose half of our enrollments from one year to the next. So these universities are gonna stick around. The issue is how are we going to um, design the the laws that ensure that the that, that part of the money that is made is reinvested into the into the schools. Okay, so you know the, this is pretty pretty standard. Access uh, to the to to higher education has benefited proportionately more um, as the, the lower you are on in the income distribution, but that's sort of expected, right? So so this this um, this reform has been a way of redistributing. Uh, or, or, or providing more opportunities to to students, which is which I think is is quite nice, right? It, 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 human capital acquisition is an engine of growth, and in that regard, um, Chile Chile is doing very well. Okay, so so here's our student conflict, right? This is uh, 200,000 students marching down the main street in Santiago, and the lady with her back to the camera is Camila Vallejos, a very stunning, very beautiful student leader. Uh, that has been in the news. She should have turned around. I agree, but unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, she didn't. So, so there's also two handouts for you to read uh, if you would like that I provided outside. There's a there's a uh, an editorial that Mary Anastasia O'Grady wrote in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago, um, that is a direct criticism of her role. And then there's an Economist uh, article uh, that that lambasts the Chilean president for what he's done. So in an in an effort to be even-handed, since we're all you know academics here, um, you can see both sides and 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 you can choose which one you 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 like more. But now I want to present to you a slightly different view of the inequality situation in Chile. Right. So so the Gini coefficient operates on all the population. So in that regard, it's a measure of stock. So it includes the inequality that is inherent in the population as a result of policies that were undertaken in the 50s and 60s, right? So if you break this down by cohort, so year of birth, then you see as you move towards the origin that people are starting to become older, right? So there's a life cycle effect on the Gini coefficient. As you get older, society gets more unequal, wages become more dispersed, right? But this one purges this graph the, the smooth line, this sort of inverted U, is sort of this, this life cycle source for the Gini coefficient, which I alluded to just before. And the jagged lines are the, specific, are the effects that are specific to each cohort, okay? So positive numbers here are good. They reduce the Gini coefficient. So if you look at the effects, uh, at what those cohort effects are, right, that means that the Chilean Gini coefficient for the people who were born in 1980, so who are about 30 today, is about six points lower than what it would have been if we just looked at the Gini coefficient. So if you look at the at the um, at that group, which is a group that was born with the new reforms in place, it seems that this way to redistribute education or to, to provide better education opportunities is actually accomplishing just the opposite effect of what the students claim, which is that low quality education in the poorer schools leads to this um, more permanent effect on the Gini coefficient like we saw in the, in the initial graph, okay? So, so I know I'm out of time, but I just wanted to point out, um, well, let me just show you this one. This one shows you how, just how mobile the Chilean um, society is, right? So you take, so, so the percentages you would read, you would take the first column, right? It says, so first decile, be the poorest group. What is the probability that 10 years later they remain in that same poor group? That's 0.29. 
Okay, so people think that this graph for Chile looks a, like a bunch of ones in the one, two, three, fours. So if you're poor, you stay poor forever. And a bunch of ones in the lower right hand corner. So if you're rich, you stay rich forever. But if you look at the numbers, you can see that there's quite a bit of movement around. So, so these stock measures, right, much like the unemployment rate gives us a very um, static view of the labor market. This one gives us a much, uh, uh, explains the dynamics quite a bit more. Okay, so, so, so I contend we're on the right path. So why, why is this a cautionary tale? Well, because the two challenges that we face, um, and I won't talk about this for very long, I'll just mention what they are, we can talk about later. One is public policy design. So part of the reason we have such a big problem with the student um, protests is because we designed a financial instrument to allow students to acquire education, which looks like a mortgage. So you take out a loan and you start paying it the first day that you start school. So you, when you don't generate any resources and there's no grace period. So of course these kids leave school and they're already in massive debt because interest has been accruing for six years. Okay, so that's a problem. So design of public policy, we're on the right track, but we're just not designing these things properly. And then the other one is the looming welfare state. Um, there's this increased reliance on the government to provide, as opposed to providing opportunities for private capital to partner with the government and give everybody much larger opportunities. The greatest example is the new transportation system that we had that has produced um, about $4.5 billion in losses, okay? Um, they just decided it had to be state provided, so let's just bite the bullet and take the loss. Uh, of those, 3.3 uh, billion are straight losses, the others are transfers to the, to the rest of the country to convince them to use the tax dollars to foot the bill. Okay, and to put that in perspective, it would have taken 2.5 billion, right, to reconstruct all of the destroyed homes after the huge earthquake in 2010. So, for us, that's a ton of a ton of money. So, hopefully, we can correct course, and even though we love our Latin American brothers, we can escape and continue to escape Latin America.